me and the guys that I used to write with, we weren't all city. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it wasn't a thing to go into another area and write our names. It was because, as far as we were concerned, we were writers, and that's what writers did. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official Com. You need the Kellervision app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Killer. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Killer Podcast. All right, eh? Here we go. Uh, just a just a king in the building. Jeez! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct central London. Or as central as you need to be, want to be, you choose to be. Big shout out to GraffitiKings.co.uk. If you haven't checked out uh, the television app, make sure you get involved. Free download, Android and iPhone. Massive. Hold tight for your street culture needs. Um, if I said the words, get the message. If I said the words, Supreme Team. If I, we are going back like carriage clocks to one of the original pioneers and creators of the graph scene in the UK, from Weetabix commercials right the way through to VHS production with Blade. You name it, um, he's here. The mighty, artful Dodger. How are you, brother? Pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> How was that for an intro? Well, not what I was expecting, but you know, it's cool. That's right. For you come into the fray, you're into the mix now. Are you? And there's a lot of people out here right now that have most definitely earmarked you for a long time as being a, an inspiration and, and a proprietor of a lot of things that are going on now. What's your, what's your feelings on that when I say that? It's kind of weird because I suppose for the most part, I kind of feel like a jobbing actor where you do a project, you move on, you do a project, you move on. So a lot of the time when you're focused on the next gig or what you've got to do next, then a lot, and also because of the fact that for the most part I keep myself to myself. Mm. What I've done in the past, it, for the most part, it's in the back of my mind. It's not something I consciously think about. It's interesting you say that. I think that's that. I think that's one of the same with a lot of creative individuals that that just want to push themselves. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it? Do you feel like that was always a? Um, that was always a, an intention, a, 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 a the mission brief, because when it, your legacy, you know, it doesn't feel like you've ever stopped. If anything, you kind of, if just from that observer and somebody that had to go back into the vaults, because, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a younger cat. I, I had to do t- some proper, from early days, you know, I wanted to know about who were the people that were inspiring my peers, you know what I mean? And yeah. Yeah, you, you evolved and moved in different ways compared to a lot of other people, even into in further into your career, haven't you? Uh, yeah, it seems weird saying career, the word career, because... <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the plan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, for the most part, it feels as if I'm just making shit up as I go along. Mm. <laughs> and, and after 30 years, it still feels like that. Um, yeah, so it's more of a thing of like where... There was never really, when I first got into writing, there was never really a long term plan as such. Mm. Like for me, it was like, wow, I'd been doing calligraphy, I'd always been doing, uh, or been interested in creative lettering uh, since primary school. Yeah. Like when we used to like have to do like projects, like each term in primary school, like about year five or whatever, we had to do like a project each term, a new project. Yeah. But I did one on aircraft, I did one on houses, uh, did one on uh, Native Americans. And each time I just like, I remember, I just remember sitting there with like a pencil and ruler, carefully sketching out the title of what the project was gonna be on the front page. Mm-hmm. And I'd spend all day on it. And the teacher said, she'd like go on my case and say, what are you doing, you've been spending hours on this thing, get it done. But I'd like take my time and stuff and, yeah, so I'd always been interested in the fact that, as well as like drawing Disney characters at primary school, I was very much into creative lettering. Secondary school, that switched to uh, calligraphy when I was about 14, 15. Our teachers got us involved in that. Though with the class, he only did one lesson because 
Everyone else was either bored with it. They started like flicking ink at each other, using the pen nibs as like darts. And... Hold tight, <laughs> hold tight, my original uh, ink abusers. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was that, and um, but I loved that. And I went to him afterwards, and I says, "Look, can I do some more of this stuff? I really like it." And he was a bit skeptical, yeah. but then um, he gave me like some a set of inks and nibs and alphabets, and says, "See how you get on with those." So what? Do, what date? What? Give me a date on that, roughly, when th- this... That was about 1980. That's actually insane to think you were right in the middle of the, the hip-hop explosion and you were given a set of pens. <laughs> no, but to be honest, I mean, I, I didn't hear about hip-hop until, like, 82, so this was, like, before that. Before that way? Well, for me, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. there may have been some people who had, like, relatives or friends or in New York or whatever, so they probably knew about it before the media explosion... But for me, yeah, I mean, calligraphy got into that. And for me, the most important thing, the thing that I loved about calligraphy was I used to copy out illuminated letters of, like, the middle-aged manuscripts and stuff like that. Mm. I was just, like, fascinated by these gold embossed letters and the swirls and stuff. And, yes, I used to love copying those. And so, like, my teacher, he saw what I was doing. He gave me a lot of support and encouragement. And I just, like, continued with it. Mm. But obviously... I was like known as like the geeky guy who drew. <laughs> so I was like the only one in my school that had an interest in calligraphy. But, you know, I didn't really care. I just like decided to get into it. And then, yeah, 82, uh, Buffalo Gals video, which for a lot of people in the, in Britain was like their taste into uh, the hip-hop world or their window into it. And then from there, I just began to like try and devour information, like any little news article or mm. cutting or whatever, I'd be all over it. And then I remember reading a Life magazine, like, and that also, that was like end of 82, and also they did like a best of Life magazine, the American magazine, and it basically had like a feature on hip-hop. Like it had like a, one of the main pictures it had in there was a picture of A1 painting his name on a wall, and then some kid holding a stool and looking over his shoulder to make sure no one was coming, and that really stuck in my mind. It's all they, It's always those it's, that, those visuals that impact you the hardest. It's the music, whatever you hear it first time, you get your rocks off on that big sound, it stays with you forever, and it's the same with pictures, isn't it? You see something, it's so impactful. Yeah, and then I began to read about what was going on on the trains, and I thought, wow, I need to, I need to do this, but I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. I was at school, didn't know anything about getting spray paint, you know, any of that stuff. Where to begin? Yeah, and this is this is an interesting angle because you kind of chose. Ju- well, I guess it's a route to any market, isn't it? As a young kid, when you see graffiti progressing the way it was, it's almost like, well, that's the most intuitive and obvious way to go about getting your work out. To a lot of people that are into graph, it ain't actually about hip hop. It's more about actually, how do I? put my message out in a creative way that yeah. resonates with people at the time. Was that more of a case that you just saw it as like a, an outlet? Yo, this, this, this graffiti thing is making moves. Did you feel it like as embracive as that? I don't know. I think it was a catalyst of different things. It's like a diff- combo- combination of different e- ingredients, that whole teenage rebellion thing, finding out who you are, trying to... Uh form your own identity of, or a certain who you feel you are. Mm. I mean, there's who you feel you are on the inside, but the other, the rest of the world, especially family and definitely parents, can see you being something else. Mm. Like, my parents, especially my dad, it was like, fucking, not, not swearing, something, but he saw me as like a loser who, because I didn't want to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, and I wanted to be, have a career in art, he thought, well, fucking waste of space you know mm, <laughs> that's mm, how we saw it mm. so it wasn't it was basically a thing of like saying look this is what i'm interested in i don't care who likes it but i feel connected to this thing mm. and then when i started to read about what was going on then i read another article about trains in new york and paint and it just it didn't show any pictures it's just says uh, people write painting their names in big bright colorful letters on mm. trains and i thought wow I need to do that. Mm. I need to get some spray paint and paint my name on a wall or a train because it just connect, It just spoke to me. Mm. And looking back, I think it's probably because of the fact that 
because I was into creative lettering anyway, doing calligraphy, into like painting illuminated letters, mm. I think subconsciously my brain made that connective link. Yeah. Like from like scribes in the Middle Ages painting illuminated letters mm. with all these swirls and connections and stuff to people in the States painting their, painting their names, big, bright, colourful letters, mm-hmm. all these swirls and stuff. I think it just like made the link. Yeah, yeah, all of a sudden it's like, ding. Exactly. Let's go back to your, your childhood growing up. Where where'd you where do you reside? Where were you residing at that age? London. London. Uh, so East Dulwich. East Dulwich. Uh, yeah, and not these types that people know now. I mean, this was like East Dulwich when I was growing up was a working class area. Mm. I mean, on the main road, uh Lordship Lane, you know, there's like I think coffee houses and bistros and delis and stuff and yeah, yeah, yeah. quaint little pub bars. Dead and, groovy, yeah. But back then it was a thing of like where there's a couple of pubs on like they're kind of like middle class pubs now, mm. or you, you know. But back then, it's like if you didn't know people, you wouldn't go in there. Mm, you you exactly, because there were just like no go areas unless you knew the people in there. I mean, just off uh, locals only kind of vibe. Yeah, definitely. Because I remember, like in the summer, like when I was about fourteen, going into a pub just off in East Dulwich, just off the main road, and at the back they had like a boxing ring, and these geezers did like bare knuckle fighting. What? <laughs> so, you know, that's what East Dulwich was like. Even though it was like that, it had kind of like that hard, hardcore working class element, you still had a mix of like English, African, Afro Caribbean, mm. you know, a few Asians. You know, it's like a good mix of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The landscape was obviously a lot different. And compared to some of the people that I've had on the show, which, in fairness, have, have lent by demographic, um, geographic of where I am, excuse me, uh, is, is being West London writers, old school, you know, um, Power Square, um, Labrick Grove, you know, yeah. that fly over, et cetera. Um, but, yo, you, you, although you were South East, you did travel. And that that's what I found in, you know, looking deeper, deeper, deeper into your kind of history you weren't actually afraid to step into any zone and do what you do. I mean, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, because it was a basically, a, it was, for me, it was about being true to the culture, being true to aerosol writing. I mean, so I remember, I think it was reading, uh, watching my name go by, where that just like really opened my mind. I mean, Subway Out was good for the visuals, but watching my name go by was good for the, Mentally gave you some. It gave much more of a deeper insight into it. Did it give you context? I mean, by the name, even by the name alone, that's like okay, right. It did because it basically went into the motivation of writers, and also mm. there was that whole thing of writers n- never being limited by geographical location. Mm. And uh, yeah, you had some affiliating with gangs or writing gang names and stuff like that. But uh, also getting up as well, uh, subway graffiti in New York. Yeah. That that was a huge inspiration for me. Yeah. I think more so than uh, watching my name go by. But uh, yeah, it was a th- whole thing of writers not being limited by geographical location. And because, as it in itself, there was a concept of going all city, mm. me and the guys that I used to write with, we went all city. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it wasn't a thing to go into another area and write our names. It was because, as far as we were concerned, we were writers and that's what writers did. So. But South, like you say, by default, like, well, Dulwich, Peckham, these areas back in the day and hold tight all the crew that watched from them ends. Uh, it was hardcore back then. Dulwich, no. Nah, I mean, it had its rough elements, but it was still calm, you know what I mean? But Peckham, yeah. I mean, Peckham's still rough around, even though it's been gentrified now, it's still rough around the edges. But, I mean, I mainly used to paint with a writer called Plaz, who went on yeah. to be one of the founding members of Tough Arts. Uh-huh. And he lived on the North Peckham Estate, so yeah. and he told me about all the walls and stuff there. So we used to like go and paint there pretty much every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what these are the messages. I mean, I've had mean on, I've scammed, like you know your name, like, your city approach, <laughs> essentially. You know, your yeah. city approach. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and with Peckham it was like, but because I was like, people got to know me there. I could walk through Peckham at like by myself at two, three in the morning and not big of it. Yeah, yeah, there was some scary characters, but yeah, I didn't get. I suppose that's the same thing with uh, 
hip hop heads in the Bronx. Like once you, like, I remember watching uh, the film The Freshest Kids and Mr. Freeze. You know, because it's like basically the only white guy around mm. in hip hop. And the dark side of it, he was saying that because he of who he was, he could pretty much walk anywhere through any neighborhood. And mm -hmm. yo, there's Mr. Freeze, and you know he had that respect. And I think it was the same for people. I think in a lot of places, I suppose, like for instance, if there were some writers that did want to paint South, like in Peckham, and they're with me, they would have been safe. Or if they were with Plaz, they would have been safe. No mm. one will touch them because of who they knew and who they were being associated yeah. with. And I guess because you got the juice of being from a, a harder area, you know, to travel around, like you say, the Bronx, it's like, well, you're from the Bronx, you know, it's the Mecca and it's pretty gritty. So, yeah. you know, you can kind of hold your head in any kind of arena, can't you? But it's funny because I kind of got that vibe from West London. I mean, I remember the first time I went to West London was like summer of 85 and you could tell there was a scene there. And I must admit, it did feel a bit intimidating for me as well because it's like, well... Yeah, I'm, I'm out here painting, but I don't know anyone here. Mm. So shit could kick off. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally, totally. Who did you used to run with when you were coming over here? What, did you used to come, you know, as a collective from the southeast? Were you on your own? Were, you know, who was... Uh, it was Supreme 85. Team. 85, it yeah. would have been definitely the Supreme team. I mm -hmm. mean, that was a crew founded by yeah. Crash 185. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Clapham Rothsides, right? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, he was... Yeah. I mean, he was a big influence to me because it's funny because, like, there used to be uh, rap jams at Albany Theatre in Deptford mm -hmm. every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I used to see him there all the time, but I didn't know who he was. Yeah. And then I remember when but he knew who I was, and we just used to, like, talk about music and stuff and writing. And then, yeah, I remember him saying, yeah, when I was writing my name, uh, what, your crash? And he says, yeah, did you know? I says, no. That must have blown your mind. It did, because I, think I used to see his name everywhere. I mean, he was like one of the writers that inspired me to get up Crash, more because yeah, yeah. he was just up in some of the most insane places. How influential was the, the Albany Theatre era, with, you know, with, with the way hip-hop was coming into, like, our culture and you having those opportunities to speak to people and meeting hip -hop, the hip-hop community firsthand? How were those jams like that back in the day? It was a thing. I mean, you had, like, three aspects to it. I mean, on Saturdays you had... Uh, spats... Of course. The Westwood did. The legendary yeah. spats, you know. Then after that, people used to, like, go down to Covent Garden and hang out there. Oh, yeah. And then on Sunday afternoons, you had, like, Shaw Theatre. So this was, like... Yeah, I mean, it's actually hard to believe. I mean, that was almost like a glory day, like, especially now in the environs that we're in. It's like, to imagine, like, those... That level of repeated events and shows that were going on across a weekend, that's crazy. But it was... Yeah, there was that, but it was more or less about... But having people from the States come over was kind of a bit sporadic. It was more or less about people over here from all aspects kind of like doing what they loved and mm. like, yeah. We'll get into the club thing a little bit more because your, your flyer game, by the way, is, was on point. It was, you did so much flyer work and all sorts of, you know, you were, it was like a phase two kind of approach of like creating art. It became a, another mode of transport, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, definitely nowhere near the level of phase two. I mean, his fly game. Just was, as an example, by yeah, the way. as an example, <laughs> yeah, 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 kind of like a yeah. I mean, I'm there. He's like, well, so yeah. I get you. It was a thing of like where you do, you get asked to do something, so you just do. You don't necessarily think of the impact because mm. it was just one small thing in terms of yeah. hanging out with the crew and like talking about places to hit and sketchy yeah. and all the rest of it so and you know the well, supreme team let me just get into actually a little bit more about the technique and style because you know there'd be people my age and younger that that you know obviously weren't there in the first generation of things but i i'm often taken aback by even you doing the tag earlier i'm just like yo like you just talk about the calligraphy and and how you interpreted it's so well refined man like the way you just even threw down on the tag, I'm just like, yo, that's like, that's a that's a calligraphy job in itself. Never mind it being part of the graffiti thing, part of the artful dodger aesthetic. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts behind that? Like, where do you where do you sit with the calligraphy and the graph and merging it together? How did you get that combination so right? I was just showing off, <laughs> plain and simple. <laughs> Like, yeah, those are the kind of arts we want. Come on, yeah. I mean, I thought, well, 
I can I spend I I can either spend ages. Yeah, because I mean I remember like uh, when I first started in calligraphy, I used to uh, hang out in Dutch Park with my mates, and I used to like have these calligraphy markers. I remember once, I like had them with me, so I thought these are like this uh, shelter uh, near the tennis court near the lake. There's like no like, near the pond in Dulwich Park, which is still there actually. <laughs> and like so, I used to like write. So I've just like no, I just show off it. Wrote my name. Uh, with these like calligraphy, like uh. calligraphy markers, and like, oh, what's that? Oh, wow, right. So I ended up writing like my mates' names on it on, all over this, like, shelter and like different calligraphy stars. And Did stuff. people lose their shit? They, they must have done because it, no, if I had seen that at a time where everyone was doing the wild stuff thing, but you came with that, yeah, it must have opened a you know, a USP to die for, like, yo, he's th- that's the calligraphy thing, yeah, and it kind of like gave me, you know, a few cool points. <laughs> Yeah. So that was cool. Yeah. So I think when I started writing a couple of years later, it was a thing like, well, well, I got my name. So, well, why not just do the calligraphy thing again? And I did. So, yeah. I mean, my mum was pissed off because she knew I did calligraphy. So when she like saw my name on bus shelters, <laughs> she instantly knew it was me. So there was no getting around it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's where, that's where, they, you know, they, the conversation on, on graph is, is there's the, there's the different styles, but ultimately that gets you recognised. You know, you yeah. can be as indi- if you almost like two individual, then you're in trouble, isn't it? Yeah, but it was kind of weird because when I began to get more into it and began to get beyond the ego thing, I thought, well, actually, I'm kind of like fucking around with people's perceptions because yeah, it's vandalism, but it's art as well. I, I hate using that term, but it's kind of yeah. It's, it's- Street art before the term street art. Uh, that's a term I hate, seriously, because... You know we only no. rock boats up here on the Killer Killer <laughs> podcast. Come on. No, but, uh, the worst is there's a different mentality between street percent. artists and writers. thousand percent. And I, I might just add at this point, big shout out to my boy Rob, who's definitely watching this at the moment, because uh, I remember I was in the pub with him the other day. Well, actually, no, I'll say the other day, maybe at least three months ago, before lockdown. And uh, he, he was like... Uh, we, you know, he's talking about graph, talking about graph, yeah. and your name came up because he got done for graph, and in in the police station, all they kept on interrogating and asking him. I mean, he's an older boy. All they kept on interrogating him was, "Are you Artful Dodger? Are you Artful Dodger? Do you know Artful Dodger?" So your reputation <laughs> yeah. from a lot from a lot of people that were getting bagged at that that time for for you know menial stuff, they were after the big fish. Yeah. You were out, out. So yeah, street. Art aside, he, he was out there, you know. Yeah. How, how does that? How does that sit with you? I remember I uh, I first heard about that when I was rolling with Supreme Team in '85 because I remember some li- yeah there was that thing of like where they'll catch the toys, the little fish, and then they'll threaten them with being sent to a Boston mm. or whatever mm. if they didn't give up names. Mm. So obviously mm. like, that's when they began to like get more names. Because that was a thing back in the day, wasn't it? It was like they treated it like a it's like fucking CSI mm. London Transport, you know what I mean? Because yeah. they were like, because I used to have a friend who worked for London Transport, and he says, what they used to do, they would photograph new tags, write down where they appeared, what time they appeared, what date they appeared, and try to build up a pattern so that, okay, this writer seems to be writing here, 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 at this time, so we're going to send other undercover around those places to try and catch them. That's they a were lot taking of, it seriously, wow. yeah. That's a lot of... Uh, did, how did, how was the pressure on you? Because that sounds to... I mean, I don't know whether that is the case these days, but that sounds to me like a lot of pressure, like the the the, 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 the trap closing in. Yeah, but it was compared to now. I mean, for me, I've got maximum respect for writers that are writing now. Mm. Simply because of the fact that there wasn't... I mean, we were, like, jumping tracks mm. at a place like Charing Cross and Oxford Circus. <laughs> you know, like, train would pull out, we'll jump across, we'll jump on the track... Tag our name on the other side, jump back before the next train came in. There were no or hardly any cameras on the platform. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just got to look out for yourself. And exactly. Have your so, eyes. yeah, so it was so easy then. Mm-hmm. But now, the amount of CCTV, and obviously because of the whole terrorist thing a few years ago, they just kind of ramped up security in a lot of places. So, writers that mm-hmm. are writing now, I've got the maximum respect for them. Yeah, it's, it's so intense, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. But on the flip side, and this is a conversation that I often have with, with people, is 
you have on one hand on one side of the scale is yeah okay it was easier to get into places back in the day it was easier to run like you say across tracks and all you had to use was your eyes in case you saw a track or anybody like that same applies with the walls same applies with the track size wherever you were doing it whatever your taste was but the paint was shit <laughs> right <laughs> The paint yeah, shit. unless you got bunt back. Which... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the paint was shit. But on the flip side, now, yeah, sure, there's there's every good reason for you not to do it. It's too intense, the security, the wires, the electrics, da 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 uh, but, but on the flip side, you've got the, some of the best paint, which exactly. means you can do massive productions on the side of people's buildings and walls and shops fronts, you know. Yeah, and also you can do them a lot quicker and you don't have to worry about priming the wall first. Like, I remember sometimes... Like when I'd be painting you know, with players uh, in Peck or South London. Mm. I remember there's a, just past Elephant and Castle, there's a girls' school called Notre Dame. Okay. And like, so, yeah, this is like back in 85. Mm. So we just like, one night we said, we should paint a piece in there. So I remember one night we had like a, a bucket of paint, like primer, roll and tray and bag of spray paint. And, you know, wait till the, all the cars are gone. We just quickly hopped over the gate primed the wall, waited about an hour of it to dry, <laughs> and then I paint my initials AD there, and it's like, okay. you wouldn't have to, with the paint you got now, you didn't have to do that, you wouldn't have to do that, no. you could just get in there, paint, and then head off. Yeah, yeah, and, and I always feel, and I've said this before, it feels like with a, with a, a personality like yourself, with a unique style, like when you see people rocking new paint with the, the same style, it's almost like a four wheel drive. It's almost like it's the it's the and it, you must feel that in some respects that it's the some of the, some of the quality of the products that are out there. It must feel like sometimes it's the it's the pieces you wanted to paint that you just didn't have the opportunity to in the in the mid eighties, perhaps. Yeah, but the saying that, but then if you look at writers like Part Two, oh, exactly, exactly. That was a whole other exactly. And the thing tight. is, he was painting with shit paint. Yeah. So for, yeah, there is a whole thing of it was restrictive, but he and some other writers Changed showed that game. if you wanted to paint and push yourself, you had you could do it with shit paint as yeah. well. Yeah, whole type part two. That realism was just a whole... Do you remember yeah. the monkey, the chimpanzee? <sighs> the thing is, I mean, the stuff that he was doing back then, there's people who can't even do that stuff now. That's right. With the good paint that they have, you know? That's so right. it just goes to show how insanely talented he is. Mm -hmm. That's right. And what you can do with the just an idea and a perseverance and just yeah. the techniques as well. Again, that go back to the eighties. Like I, I really, really admire very much. Like guys who do the DJ scratching stuff, you know, and the up faders, turntables, cross. It's, it's, with restriction comes creativity. Yeah, I love that. The techniques. Explain some of the techniques to make the colours that you would have done back in the day. I don't know. I mean, I remember uh, interviewing Shock for Get the Message, and he was one that told me about the whole thing that you get one can, you put it in, a free, in the freezer to lower the pressure, mm. and then you get another can, and then you put the tube in, and then you spray one from one to another to mix colours. And that blew my mind because I wasn't thinking on that level, but it just goes to show how insanely geeky <laughs> some writers got. Because I think if you have that technical mindset, then coming up with ways to mix paint mm. or make paint better or make fat caps and stuff is going to be in your mindset and mm. you're going to like push things to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think going back to a point that you mentioned earlier about the whole thing with Supreme Team, uh, like I said, that was Crash's crew. I mean, basically, the concept behind that is that he wanted to form a super crew. I'm glad he brought this up. I was just about to jump into this. Go on. <laughs> yeah, so his thing, I mean, our goal was he says yeah he, he said he wants to be honest he wants us to he wanted us to be like the best street writers or writers in london right break down the key the key members in the crew break down the next so obviously names. there was crash crash yeah 151 uh there was plaz uh there was juicy three oh jet 302 Woo! uh there was Hayes 272 there was design who used to write zach he had like long hair Right, right, right. And and myself. So yeah, the wow. six of us. And so how long was the rampage of Supreme Team? How long was that that legacy? I'd say for? from about May through to October eighty five. Short period. It was, but it's like 
we, I mean, the last leg would have been great if we'd have continued, but we just kind of like, yeah, kind of went our own separate ways, sadly. But uh, it was a thing of where, yeah, he says that, uh, yeah, I remember Crash saying to us when we first had like our first crew meeting that he wanted us to take out the Chrome Angels. That was the aim. That's fighting talk. Yeah, it was like saying, well, fuck it, let's go for the best, let's take yeah. them on. So, yeah. okay. so it was like, yeah, and I was like, yeah, fucking hey, let's do it. You know, who, who, were they on your site? Were they in your sites? Who else were in your sites at the time? You know, like with no limits. Were were oh god, there was something non stop, non stop. Yeah, mm. yeah, that was all right. The thing about it is, it was friendly rivalry. I mean, you knew who yeah. the best were, who yeah. the heads were to kind of aim to be better than. That. So yeah, it wasn't a bitchy thing. It was a thing of like, well, whoa, shit. They've done this. We mm. should do that. So, so basically, it was good because yeah. half the competition because you'd see what they did, and then you'd like want to up your game to be as good as or better than that. And and I know you've seen a couple of the episodes. One particular one that sticks out was with Insane and Rich, where they said, you know, competition, particularly now, needs to happen because that makes the scene that makes the scene healthy. It, it, you know. To be honest, I mean, yeah, that's one thing. I mean. T- Fucking, I mean, yeah, I, I don't give a shit if I get flack for it, but identity politics is fucking up a lot of shit. Mm. And I think when Labour came with a liberal shit of stopping sports day and competitions, I thought, what are you fuck with? What the fuck are you doing? Mm. That is human nature. That's how nature causes things to evolve, to mm. develop, to grow, by pushing, testing, competing. Survival of the fittest. Yeah, I'm not talking about it in a tour sense of fuck everyone else it's all about the rich but I mean in the sense of eight, eight place trophies kind of thing yeah it should be healthy competition and that causes people to be better because the thing about it is if you teach kids that, oh yeah we're all the same everyone's equal and then they get out into the world and when they're competing yeah. for jobs and places at uni or doing exams it trickles down yeah they find that it's, life's not like that they're fucked yeah and sh- shit and or get off the pot you know exactly yeah. yeah. If you're and, not... then, and then that's just like in your local city. What about in the country? What about on the world stage? Mm. And that's, yeah, because I remember that period in like the 80s when Britain was like doing shit at the Olympics and shit in other sports events yeah. on a global scale. It's like, well, maybe this whole thing of everyone's equal ain't going to work. And then they start having sports academies. Yeah. I mean, look at, for instance, uh, football in America. Not soccer people. Football. <laughs> round ball. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, yeah. Look, if you look at football in America, I remember I was over in Atlanta in 1994. And all I was hearing was about the Baseball World Series and the NBA Championship. Yeah. yeah. They had the World Cup there. Mm, nothing. nothing. Didn't hear fuck all on, mm. the, on the... I thought, wow. They don't give, they've got the tournament yet. They don't give a fuck about it. Mm-mm. Look at them now. Mm. Now, exactly. The amount of millions they've invested. And, and now, I reckon... I mean, personally, I think that America will win the World Cup before Britain does. That's right, because they're putting the... Again, it's not the eighth-place trophy thing. They're focusing on their key people being the best. And yeah. If they've invested... Is the other thing as well, investing? Investment, yeah. Because that makes all the difference. People are incentivized yeah. all of a sudden. Um, you're right, man. I, I can't help but feel that that, that that holds true to a lot of... A lot of scenes. A lot of scenes. Yeah. There needs to be a competitive aspect. I mean... If you don't have titles, then what you got, what's your goals? What are you aiming for? You're just coasting. The whole scene's coasting. But not just that. I mean, like, I remember I saw uh, some clip on, I think it was like uh, Sky News Australia. And <laughs> they're hardcore sometimes. Yeah, but yeah, are. it was talking about one of Joe Biden's things is to allow men that, that identify as being female onto female sports teams. That, that, that just don't work, will it? I have, no, I have no words. That's just fucking nuts. But like I said, identity politics is fucking up a lot of shit. So yeah. what do you expect? The DNA and the, the, the muscular build of a man that... <laughs> well, not just that. Just so you get some fucker who says, well, I'm a female just because he wants to win. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, big shot. <laughs> 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 totally. Um... Uh, but then at the same time, when you think about 
graffiti or even beatboxing and DJing, that kind of does my head in. Like, why did I put why did, why put girls in a category of beatboxing? We've all got the same voice box and each one's different. Kind of want girls and boys to merge together and just have one place, one winner. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I mean, to me, that, that I suppose I can get the whole thing of encouraging more girls or women to get involved in it. 100%, yeah. But at the same time, if you're going to put them in a category by themselves, then they're not going to be accepted as equals. That's right, yeah. And then they, Simple as. They, 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 their performance may ex- exceed any, you know, male, but they're, you know, treated with some level of... Um, Lower, yeah, handicap. the whole thing. Oh, you're good for a girl, yeah, exactly. It keeps them in that dumb arena, yeah, 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 yeah. My mate Zubi, um, well known guy, pundit MC, he uh, he won the world champion in the female deadlift, <laughs> he's the female deadlift champion. He just registered himself as a girl and won just to challenge, challenge exactly, the media. Yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, going back to you, yeah, Supreme, Supreme Team, so that that time. Uh, as short as it was, the impact was pretty crazy, wasn't it? In what sense? Well, it's just it was just having so many dynamics within one crew and being competing against like the likes of Chrome Angels and and uh, and the. Well, we didn't the get day. to that point. I mean, it was a thing like where I remember summer of. <clears throat> it was a thing like where by the end of summer we wanted we were going to battle them. Yeah, that was our mindset. We're going to work hard. We're going to practice. We're going to be out there right. We're going to be bombing stuff, and then yeah get better at painting, and then the end of summer, like September, October, yeah, we should be ready to battle Chrome Angels. It's crazy. But what? then I remember Mode came back from Paris because they'd been in Paris that summer. Yeah. And I'll type Mode too. He showed, uh, he was like in Covent showing us photos of what they'd produced. And then we were looking like, fuck. Was that intimidation? That sounds to it's me like, like he's just... Yeah, we didn't say anything. We just like, oh, fuck, well... Maybe next year. We'll really, battle, really? We'll battle them next year. Man, <laughs> you must have been like a... Because when you think of a formation of a collective in any, you know, in any genre or walk, like, it goes without saying that your style is so versatile and you've got this calligraphy thing that is just popping. Like, you must have been like some sort of, like, secret weapon or some shit. Not really. I, I didn't see like that. I just saw myself as... For, like for me, I saw that each crew member had strengths and strong points that I looked up to. Yeah. Like for me, Crash was a style master, mm-hmm. a definite style master. Because I remember mm-hmm. every time I saw him, he was like form, formulating a new tag style for another young writer mm-hmm. that was up and coming. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow. Really? He, so he was like passing on information and for new upcoming... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> If you almost like speak to Prime about that, he'll tell you that yeah, he was a big inspiration to a lot of writers, especially in like the Southwest London area. Mm. Yeah, so for me, he was one of the ones that writers that I looked up to that I like says I want to be like Crash. You Do know? you know what's crazy is like I guess it's like Hendrix playing his guitar or, you know, the first time you hear a certain horn play Miles Day, I don't know. It almost becomes such a given in this day and age, that you see a particular style from a t- certain era. You're one of those people that stylistically holds true throughout the... I mean, even what you did on the thing, I'm just like, yeah, oh, that ain't just... That is just ahead of itself. It's almost like a given that you'd hear a middle eight guitar riff happening or a lead guitar happening in a song. It doesn't... It, it, it's just a given. You, but at that time when, you know, someone like Crash was doing his thing, the, he was experimenting on so many levels and like you say passing torches to other youngsters and stuff it's actually kind of mad Un- it's unthinkable that that was really so ahead of itself for its time do you know what i mean talking mm-hmm. here and now mm-hmm. crazy it is i mean but yeah i suppose you see things differently when you're actually in something and then when you look at it step back and look at it in hindsight you know have a different perspective on it I mean, one thing I remember Crash saying was, because uh, I cause obviously like, you like ask people where they get the name and stuff like yeah. that. And like, uh, I think Juski, uh, he won a one. I think that was his door number. <laughs> <laughs> and that's don't, know where, don't know where he lives. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Crash, I remember asking him, and he says, oh, that's his granddad's street number in New York. So I thought, Cool. That is cool as fuck. Yeah. Cold. 
Um, let's get into some spats. Let's get into some Covent Garden. Come on, you know, talk to me about these days. Talk to me about the graininess, the sea Talk talk to me about the uh, the feel, the context. Put, put put us in that mood. Where where what was it like in spats? What was it like in outside in the heat of you know activity in Covent Garden? Talk to me about that. Spats, to be honest, I didn't really go to that often because I was mainly at home sketching, and then I just loved bowling to uh, Covent afterwards. But it was, I mean, yeah, I've heard some people say that oh yeah, Covent Garden was great. Was everyone together? No. Fucking wasn't. If you're in like the inner circle, then it was. But spicy, spicy, all no, time. No, it's basically it was like school, and like you had like the London All Stars and like the, some of the breakers and the born and rappers and DJs. They were like the cool kids, mm. and then like you had like some other breaking crews and rappers and DJs, people just hanging out, and then you had like the writers in their section. We were like the mm. fucking geeky kids <laughs> kind of thing, <laughs> the outsiders. So, yeah, I mean, everyone was pretty much in their role. I mean, people, yeah, intermingled, but you could pretty much see who the DJs were, who the writers were, who the rappers were, stuff like that as well. Really? So, is it, so is there was a lot more order than the way I imagine it. I imagine, like, a lot of... Come <laughs> out, I mean, you know, you see some of the original docs and the movies and stuff, and, yeah, it's all very romantic, but there also is an undertone of, of, of police, um, you know, racism... Uh, that kind of impacts and comes in and you're just like, what the fuck, you know, and it's really super intense and then there's the crowd, the tourists and everything and, and then like you say, you've got the heads as well, the original guys that, that are coming in and then there's the, the rivalries and stuff. So, yeah, it, 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 you put it in quite a good perspective there that actually it wasn't actually as, as, as yeah, fancy as you think. Yeah, it was like school. I mean, because the thing is, like, you're talking, you put a bunch of teenagers together, they're going to act like a bunch of teenagers pretty much and so you're going to get people hanging out who are friends you're going to get some people bitching about other people, mm. some people not speaking to other people, or, or oh, these group of cool kids aren't speaking to that person, mm. so other people aren't speaking to them just because those people aren't speaking to them. You know, that's kind of petty teenage stuff. Yeah, you know, so. I get you. Yeah, I get you. But, yeah, there was a lot of love there as well. I mean, I remember, like, because it got colder, like, towards, like, October, November, like, after spats, would all go down to the Charing Cross subway. And so that was like another inner jam, like another indoor jam, because like you'd have someone with like a well, like a bench box. kind of thing, is or more like a get the right lino out. Well, we're we're dancing. Well, the thing about it, you had like a tiled, well, like chain cross some subway. Uh, there's like a large part of it which has like a tiled floor. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I mean, you didn't yeah. need liner. You could basically say like you'd find people just break in and pop in direct onto the floor. And then you had someone with a beatbox, and then. Some, yeah, exactly. And then there'd be like little battles and challenges and stuff. And so it's almost like another jam after. It's just like riddled with after parties, basically. Yeah, kind it's of like that. Covent to Charing Cross. Um, mm-hmm. How many people were in Charing Cross at any given time when that would pop off? I'd say at least 100. That sounds more fun than Covent Garden. <laughs> it sounds it like. It kind of was, because it kind of like had this enclosed vibe. It was like a jam. That's great. No one's ever actually brought up this. this period of time where that actually happened it was a bit like uh that scene in uh beat street when rock steady first yeah. meet up with uh new york city breakers that's cold really in the sense in the sense of like that sort of area that because like, they could have if they started battling there and be in the big crowd and like your music and stuff it would have been like a little jam yeah, type yeah. Of thing. and that's so that's what chain cross was like that's mad and um would you like <clears throat> you talked about mode being there and stuff there were key people that at the time, I guess you didn't figure were like key. They were just friends or mutuals or, you know, rivals, but you didn't realise at any given time that they would become what they are now. It was, but these are like grounds of like, it's an incubation place, isn't it? Where people discover Yeah, each other. but also there was like a lot of people that weren't there. Like, for instance, I remember once uh, me and the rest of the Supreme team were heading down to Covent on a Saturday afternoon and we saw this guy like, just, like, walking away, like, like, he was just leaving. And, like, you know, writers, for the most part, you can tell writers. There's just mm. something about you can tell another writer. And then he looked at us and we looked at him and we says, do you write? And he says, yeah, yeah. Mm. There's that whole suspicious thing of why are you asking? I mean, it's kind of weird because... It is a scent-smelling <laughs> affair, isn't it? It's like... <laughs> it's that, but it's also a thing, like, which I think it kind of sticks with you throughout your life, for the, for the most part. I've, like, for instance, I'm still suspicious of authority... I still don't like giving out my name. I still don't like my photo being taken. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. My girlfriend thinks I'm like 
unnecessarily paranoid. Mm. Mm. <laughs> she can't get her head around it, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, so this guy we met, he says, so you're right? He says, yeah, what do you write? And he says, illustrator. You're... Because his was a Ooh. name I've seen all over. It's like one of those names which you see yeah. and you do, oh, who is this guy? Yeah. And I nearly blew my mind. I thought, you're an illustrator. I thought, oh, shit. I love it when that happens, man. I nearly lost my shit. It's like, wow, you're an illustrator. Do you know Kosh? Because he used to like write with a lot of Kosh. And, it's, and it says, yeah, yeah, he, that he knows Kosh, him and Kosh are good just friends. opens doors of like realms of possibilities. Yeah, just... and I thought, is he coming down? He says, mm. no, he doesn't, he's not into this sort of thing. He's not going to come down. So I thought, oh, shit. We alluded to it at the start before we went recording, you understand? And um, you said just then that some people just weren't there. Um, there's this, uh, and I think people are forgiven in part to, to, to think this way because I've heard the stories and stuff and I've watched it, you know, done my R&D and often I get completely caught up in the moment of seeing these things take place back in the day to the point where I can refer to it as, as a matter of fact. I wasn't there, man. And uh, there, there's certainly people that weren't there that you, you could almost certainly, hands down, say, yo, you contributed to the culture. You know, you may not have been at Covent Garden, but you were a huge part of the, the tapestry of, of the scene. And then there's some people that swear blind they were there. <laughs> they were definitely at Covent Garden. And it's like, a lot of times I had conversations with no, you weren't there, bro. You weren't there. They weren't there. It's like, I think people get... They get caught up in the moment, don't they? They, you know. I think there's part of that, and I think there's also a part of things like where people who are like getting reputations now or whatever, or putting, or have got themselves in positions where they're speaking like an authority, mm. it does their career better for them to say they were there mm. at this monumental thing type of thing. I mean, yeah, there's two sides to it. There are those which weren't there because, come on, guy, you really, you're like, you'd have been, like, seven years old. There's no way you're fucking there. <laughs> shut, shut, shut. <laughs> <laughs> but, and there's other people who weren't there simply because they didn't want to be a part of the whole Coven thing. Mm. But they were still, like you say... Yeah, because I remember uh, I used to know a uh, writer, I used to write Zexky and another writer. And I think it was Hayes, yeah, he... Because he knew I was into DJing. So he gave me a tape of this DJ friend of his... And, yeah, this was, like, summer of 85, and he says, that, yeah, this is a friend of mine who, mm. DJ, he's a DJ, you know, he's got his decks and collects break beats and stuff, but he's not just sitting coming to Coven. And I mm. listened to the tape, and the tape was fucking awesome. Mm. Mm. I thought, shit, who is mm. this guy? Mm. You know, so, must, so that showed me that there's, and also me in Illustrator and about Kosh as well, as writers, that there's lots of people out there who were just interested in doing their own thing. There mm. weren't necessarily interested in being a part of Coven because it just wasn't really for them. Any uh, names, I mean, not put any on the spot for you here, but is there any names that you feel that you could mention now that could do it getting recognised that weren't in those socials, that were elusive, that were writers for a season and, and didn't... Is there any names that you can think offhand that you're like, yo, give them the, 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 the reach now? Uh, not offhand, but uh, I think... Give them the flowers, so to speak. Well... Yeah. Stephen Cams from Camden, definitely. I mean, they weren't around covered much, but I think they're writers, which, they're from Camden sides. So mm. They're writers which definitely deserve some recognition. I mean, they're really, they were really cool as a crew, mm. really cool guys and fucking talented. I mean, they're the sort of writers which you would have expected to be on the same level as Crow Angels, in my opinion. Really, yeah. yeah. Okay, spell their names, uh, spell that out there. Demon Cans. Demon Cans. See, man, and this is what it's all about, really. It's, it's giving a platform for people to express, document, tell their side, but also give give props where maybe the unsung heroes, so yeah. to speak, you know. Um, in terms of hip-hop creative journeys... I mean, I mentioned the, the, the flyer artwork and such and, and the, 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 the contribution that you gave to that. You've also done like production work for different theatres. You've done, you know, production with Blade as well. Um, talk to me about, first of all, yeah, let's get into the flyer thing. Like, what you, what's, what's, what, because again, you, the distinct style and hip hop flyery back in the day was like so the thing, wasn't it? You know, 
some of these flyers that you you were creating, they they kind of held it up, in my opinion, anyway, from some of the mm. friends that I have. Big shout out, people with documents. That uh, it, yeah, that they're 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 pieces. They're in. They're like collectors items. Yeah, but at the time I didn't really see them as that. I mean, otherwise I would have kept the originals and just given them photocopies. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of those things that a lot of time when you're in the middle of something, you're just kind of doing it. You're not yeah. really thinking about the context. It's just like one thing which comes to mind now is in my days in Covent, I think one of my biggest regrets is I didn't have a camera. That's what everybody in London says, bro. Everyone. Yeah. They cite things in memory. You know, it's, not, it's the quote-unquote bumpkins that actually have the photos. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're the ones which when they came to London, it was an event for them, so they wanted to document it. Mm. I think for a lot of people in the London scene or the Covent scene or whatever, because we were there like every weekend, it was just like, yeah, we're just here. Mm. So you don't think of documenting it because you're just living it. You don't think of this is going to mean something one day yeah. type of thing. Yeah, totally. We should document this. No, that wasn't really... Because, um, I mean, think about it. Imagine like some of those classic battles. Imagine if they were like, recorded or you know it's like little things like that it would have been insane oh, and like dance battles rap battles and challenges and stuff. it just oh imagine if we had that bro i don't care what anyone says about westwood right that guy is someone i often if i had a legacy like that geezer has the content the volumes of like God forbid, if anything happens to Westwood, you can't deny for a second, no matter how much he's wavered in his career, and it might not be to everyone's taste, he might have said a few things, done a few things, missed a few bullets, but, yo, he's got... He was there from the beginning, and the content, and I think, fuck, someone documented something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, the tapes would have been would have been great with his show and that, yeah, but... And also the stuff that he must have, like, the tapes that he must have. Mad. Can you imagine? The exclusives. Exclusive mixes of record. Because I remember sometimes he'd like play stuff. Yeah. Like say, yeah, and this is a new record by blah, blah, blah. And then you actually hear the vinyl when that came out. And that's different from what Westwood played. Yeah, that in itself is like kudos. Whoa. Yeah, so he's obviously getting different mixes before the official vinyl release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's mind-blowing, isn't it? Yeah. How much? How many volts do you think he's got? Untold. Even like Zulu jam tapes, he must have an insane amount, you know. Damn, that shit just needs to come out into the open, man. I mean, there's me trying to coax Kilo to get the visual graphics out. Like, you imagine the content that, you know. Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah, yeah, he's got an insane amount. I mean, kudos to these people who've been recording it because, yeah, yeah, I suppose in time. I don't think it ever serves anybody wrong to be ahead of the curve and documenting anything. Because as much as the pressures and stress and all the things and the you know the kleptomaniac you know a, a, a ocd about having to get the stuff and it does fare well in the end doesn't it it does yeah i think as long as you do something with it or you plan well not plan to do something with it because plans can get interrupted or derailed but i think as long as you end up doing something with what you got 100 percent. can i get into the weetabix uh piece this is like you know and it'd be i'd be foolish to not because i just remember it vividly as a kid it was just such a huge just as you know this is how i was introduced to you do you mm -hmm. know what i mean because it was so nationwide it was a big fucking deal that, yeah <clears throat> and it really was a step up for graf I, I felt it was like one of those kind of landmark moments where it's like it was taken seriously by a brand and the brand really got behind you and the the piece itself as well, you know, the the character, the, the, the whole thing, you know, it was just... <laughs> I didn't do the character. The guys that did the uh, character for the TV adverts, they did the character. But as a whole p platform, it was just the shit. Yeah, but, I mean, to go into that, initially I later heard from uh, Kev Wan, because he, he said that he saw the art director who contacted me Dan Covent once and he met Cave One, Cave One, and just by chance, because he was walking through there on his way to work. And they had a lot of chat for a couple of minutes. And Cave One told me that initially they saw the work in Covent Garden and so were after the Chrome Angels to do it. Right. But the Ooh. Chrome Angels were in Paris. 
breaking news. Hold tight, go on. So, so, that's, so that should have been the Chrome Angels gig. So the reason why I got to do it was because I'd done like a piece on a youth club wall, which was about 12 feet high and like 60 foot across. And it was like a local newspaper came out and did the, an article on it. And like, yeah, so... 12 feet, big piece. Yeah, it took about five days to do it. Me and Plaz did it wow. in Peckham. And yeah, so the uh, youth centre, they organised for a local newspaper to come out to do an article on it. And the guy who wrote the article... He put my newspaper, he put my phone number in, at the end of the article. Yeah, if anyone wants me. And I, I lost my shit when I thought, what the fuck are you doing? Was it a home number as yeah. well? Yeah. Oh, there was no mobile. There was no mobile there, yeah. yeah so. What am I talking about? And no. I thought, shit, if my mum finds out, I'm fu-. You know, I was shitting it. And also because those days I was like, staying up to like two, three in the morning sketching. Whenever I heard like a car driving by like late after 1 a.m., I turn the light off. Look, I was super paranoid really? for about two months. Yeah, that can't be good for your Thinking health. Fight, if I get raided, yeah, yeah, that can't be good for your health. No, I was seriously stressed. And then I did get a phone call from a like someone phone. Said, yeah, is this the Artful Dodger? And it says, No, who's this? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> and then it says, Oh, well, I saw an article in a local newspaper. Um, I'm from. Uh, you know, we wanted, like, graffiti painting done for an advert. And I says, uh, well, that might be me. Hmm. Yeah, tell me more. Mm. And I says, yeah, so basically we have a meeting, went down there. And I says, yeah, we want to do, like, an ad campaign using spray painting. And, yeah, my first... And he says, yes, yeah, so I'm going to go on billboards all around the country. And I says, well, I'll be allowed to put my name on it. And he says, yeah, I'm doing it. That's it. Didn't care. Yeah. Wow. Because I just thought my name on billboards all around the country. You're going to get quadruple the problems that you feel like you. Well, I'm just I was thinking national fame. That that because obviously as a writer, that's like the main thing I was what I was doing it for. I thought, oh, if I can have my name on billboard around the country, fuck yeah, I'm doing it. You know, it's a it's a funny one, isn't it? Because like you were saying at the time, you were doing illegal activity, and then this thing came about. Can you uh, it, back in them days? Could you survive on doing something as such a big deal as that and still hold an integrity, your feet on the ground on the illegal side of things? It was difficult because by the time that it was actually came to do the painting, uh, I was in two minds about whether to actually go through and do it. Really? Yeah, because I thought, well, this isn't what I got into writing for. I didn't get into writing to make money. I got into writing to get fame. And, and like Crash was saying that, well, actually, I don't think you should do I think it should be a crew piece, and I think, you know... Well, to save your face so that you can still operate in no, the... No, he was saying that, well, if you're going to be... Well, because you're a member of the Supreme Team, if you're going to do a piece, then you should have all the crew's names on it. Did that conflict? Did that Was that conflicting from your point of view? Yeah, because it's like, on one hand, I can see where it's coming from, but on the other hand, it's like, I don't think they're going to allow that. And mm. I think also when I did write my name on it, it was in like a spray paint. Well, I should have pushed for the original tag, but then that's, you know, when you're kind of dealing with these things on your own and sometimes you look back and think, actually, I should have mm. pushed harder for what I felt was real. It was, a, But then I thought it was like, fuck it. So, and also the first one I did was like chrome letters, which the he- the Weebix had say it looked too dark and menacing that they wanted something more readable. So interesting. The, yeah. So the one that I ended up doing and like... Uh, Juski, he did like some of the background for that. I did the letters, he did some of the background. Mm. But like the second one I did by myself and that was like more in terms of what they wanted, like bright colours and stuff. Mm, mm, mm. Pleasing the, the underground and trying to mould to their way of thinking and the marketing and the media. I don't know, I wasn't really thinking about that. Because like, once it was done, it was done. It's like, yeah. okay, right, back to the street stuff. So... Yeah. It's funny, isn't it, uh, perception? Because I mean, I've certainly been there with beatboxing, you know. You make certain... Oh, this is just me speaking, by the way. You make certain moves that you know full well is way outside of the radar that you, you're you zoning in. Um, but by doing it, you take a hit in one aspect, but you know, just like all good publicity, good or bad, you know you do it, it will return in a pos- It'll turn into a positive two or three years down the line, you've just got to take that, you've got to take that leap of faith in a commercial world just to make sure that your name is cemented, mm-hmm. isn't it? 
Do you think that happened? I think that happened. For me, not really, no, because it was a thing of, like, I remember speaking to... Because I must admit, when it did come out, I thought, well, my mum was on my case to get a nine-to-five. She's like, that whole get a job or get the fuck out. So. <laughs> Didn't happen now. That's gone now, right? And I was thinking, look, if this thing hits, then I should get loads of offers of work. and that That's a the theory. Mm. Yeah, for me, it was like, basically, I don't want to have a regular nine-to-five. I want to do what I love. Uh, I love painting. I love drawing and stuff. So if I can make a living out of that, great. Mm. It didn't necessarily have to be through writing, but just something creative. And it would also keep my mum off her back. But when, yeah, I didn't get anything through that. And it was, and when I spoke to the art director, you know, he like just like phoned me up to tell me that it was uh, coming out and stuff. And yeah, he called me a couple of weeks later and says that actually they got a lot of shit from that. So other advertising companies didn't want to touch it. What, what, what type of shit did they get? They said that they were getting letters and phone calls from council saying it's encouraging vandalism. And also the fact that one of the characters was doing that. Oh. Or the character was doing that, saying that that's the... Devil. Yeah, exactly. Devil, you're, you're supporting devil worship. Is this a devil worship thing because you're promoting it? Yeah. Blah, 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 yeah. blah. But they just got so much flack from concerned citizens, from authorities, transport authorities, councils, local government that a lot of advertising companies just thought, you know what, we don't need that shit and just wouldn't touch yeah. it. And for its time, people would go, oh, for fuck's sake, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, not, I mean, the thing, it was a strange time in Britain because also remember that those Weetabix characters, I mean, yeah, they kind of like put one in hip-hop gear, but before that, they were skinheads. <laughs> right. <laughs> so let's Let us forget. remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? From skinheads. Even though that was probably uh, imitating that. life, because I'm sure you had like, some skinheads. Well, yeah. But I mean, it's like... the hip hop later on down the line. You go down to the oil shop in... Oh, I can't remember the name of the oil shop in... Um, in Camden, and, you know, they'll set the walls to rights, and the, but in the corner there'd be, like, this kind of blow-up, kind of cuddly toy of, a, of, of that... that Weetabix oi character. Like... <laughs> I don't know how charming that was back in the day. To me, that's just... People uh, just It was just Britain. People just accepted it. There yeah. was no, oh, that's racist. You can't... It's like... Remember, yeah. advertising companies will jump on whatever's in the mainstream. Just moody shit, that was. Now that I think about it, I'm like, yeah, that... It was the cartoons all animated and stuff in the 80s. I remember the commercial vividly. Yeah. You know what I mean? And how that installs in people's minds. Marketing and media is such a mad one, isn't it? Yeah. Because if you're not flavour of the month, then out you go. And I'm sure hip hop back then was such the flavour of the month. It's like, yeah, let's get graffiti everywhere. It was. I mean, yeah. I mean, you couldn't take you know breakfast TV with like breakers and poppers and Blue Peter with DJs and rappers. Mm. You know, it was like insane. Mm. It's mad. You were very much on the roller coaster, though, brother. You were, you were in the right that like artful dodger. Do you know what I mean? How, the weird thing is, my first love was the music. Yeah. So, yeah, when I got my... Uh, with the money I got from Weebix, I thought, wow, now I can buy my decks. Sick. That was my first thought. And then came... Was it, would I be right in thinking, because I'm, you know, I'm trying to map it out you know, from, from t- on a timeline, when did, when did you forge the relationship with Blade? Hold tight, Blade. Big shout out, Blade. Um, when did that kind of relationship begin from a production point of view? Uh, well, first I'd started, I mean, Kev One, who was, who used to write under the name Xerox and was part of the Trailblazers, he moved to South, you know, I know him from Covent, he mm. moved to South London, New Crop, no, uh, Forest Hill, just down the road from me. Yeah. So we used to hang out. And because also he was interested in rhyming and I was interested in DJing, he just like used to come around mine and to go around his and when I got my decks, he used to be like rhyming and stuff. And <laughs> so we decided to put a demo tape together. Mad. Yeah, so I started working on demos in like eighty six. Yeah, eighty six. So you invested in yourself, and you got the decks, and you started. Yeah, so then I began to like, so the writing stuff kind of like, and also after the uh, implosion of the Supreme team, mm. it was like myself, uh, Plaz, and Kev won for a while. Then Plaz. Uh, yeah, he uh, became... Yeah, he was helping out uh, Drone 2. Mm. 
<laughs> because he was a good friend of his because, you know, they were like, they had like a new chill friend as a cousin. Mm-hmm. Or John Two's cousin was a good friend of Plaza's and they knew each other and stuff. Wow. So he used to like give them stuff and yeah, he ended up being one of the founding members of the Tough Arts crew. Mad. Mad. And then Juski, obviously he went to London Giants and yeah. yeah. Wow, the tapestry, that's insane. Isn't it? Just like network. Yeah. But like with the demo stuff, yeah. So me and Kev once started doing demo stuff. And then uh, Cookies, I'd known them from a jam which I DJed at in Nottingham, just like doing some cutting, and so they asked me to be their DJ. Damn! Uh, but that didn't work out, and so me and Kev one fell out over it because he wanted to focus on just us two, and he didn't like the fact that I was working with going to be working with Cookies. So, yeah, so after the Cookies thing uh, didn't work, me and Kev Warren kind of got back together and then we started to take the demo stuff a stage further. As in, initially it was just like putting beats together on cassette and him rhyming and writing. Whereas in like 87, uh, we actually started to talk about going to studio and doing studio time, getting studio so time. There's an incubation period of development and I'm in an R. It sounds to me, bro, like <clears throat> if I'm really honest, because you're a good guy. You know what I mean? You And... You, you come across as like the guy. You're happy to say yes. You know you're up for it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that holds a lot in someone with a personality like that to just have opportunities. Sounds to me like you've had a lot of opportunities that you said yes to and worked it out accordingly. Um, and I think that comes a lot through personality, man. I don't know, but then again, it's like because like we hooked up with another couple of guys that we knew from Nottingham, Cassius and Mark. Gamble. I'll talk my not own crew all day. And yeah, so there was a f- four of us and then we called, then Kev one came up with the name Crush Hour. Crush Hour. Yeah, okay. and we all ended up doing, like, we are going to be basically doing rap stuff and because those guys, their background was like soul and funk and stuff. Uh, and Mark Gamble, he was a wicked engineer and kind of like produced in terms of putting together melodies and stuff like that. Mad. Yeah. He was like uh, the Vince guy from uh, Depeche Mode. and Okay, yeah. gotcha, okay. He was like that. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then it got to be thing, because they were in Nottingham and we were in London, yeah. I think mainly inspired by Cassis, they ended up kind of like, they got a, where they were having meetings with Fon Records. Okay. And then, next thing you know, they released uh, a house record under the name Crush. Okay. Uh, and it's just empty, so it's like... Uh, okay. Kind of those Suggestive, yeah. yeah. Uh. So me and Kev one continued, and they just began to think of... We began to get... We were really frustrated because we were, like, hustling our demos and stuff. People were like, I'm in an R room, but they weren't giving us anything. So, yeah, just had to kind of, like, call it a day, and Kev one just kind of, like, went his own way. <sighs> Yeah, and it was also a thing like where UK acts weren't really getting signed. Or the ones that were getting signed were those which could be marketed as the UK equivalent of whatever was big in America. Right, yeah. Like Cookie Crew, Salt and Pepper. For sure. Merlin, uh, he was supposed to be the UK's answer to Rakim. And, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. Which, which in turn created this like self-identification crisis within the UK because it... And then, listen, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan, man. Like, I love the old school stuff, you know, Hijack, Demon Boys, you know, mm. Caveman, all these kind of, like, different eras, you know, Scientists of Sound, who, which did have, a, they had American accents too, but I'm a, I was a fan of them, yeah. you know. Um, but, yeah, there, there was definitely this kind of juxt where you had, like, labels that wanted one thing and tried to marry up and compare to America, but the, the Joe public, they weren't often thinking in the same context were they no they weren't the thing about it is but then again i think that says a lot about uk business in general the fact that most companies over here want to play it safe and will go down a tried and tested route yeah as opposed to say you know what let's take a chance with this no i'm not saying all companies obviously because there are the trailblazers but for the most part you get the pack they just want to play it safe and the thing about it is with the music business you had the same thing, so that was really frustrating. Yeah, I bet it was, without question, because you're, you're trying to be fitted into a box, which is the complete yeah. opposite that someone like Arthur Dodger wants to be doing, you know? Yeah. And then uh, I think it was like, uh, because me and Kev, we got on good relations with Rhythm King, it was a thing like where we just ended up going down there and hanging out. Mm. 
which was kind of weird saying that, you know, you can go hang out at a record company you're not signed to, <laughs> but as if but you can hang out there as if you're signed. Like, we yeah. can just walk into the office. Yeah. You don't have to wait around at research. You can just walk in there, sit in the office while meetings are going on. And cool as fuck. Help yourself to records and yeah. merchandise and stuff. And yeah. You want a coffee? Go get a coffee. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, when uh, they, after She Rockers, the initial group split, and Antonia and Donna were going to be like the new She Rockers, mm-hmm. I got asked to be... Uh, well, they tried me out as like her. Well, initially it was going to be uh, Antonia. They t- they'll try me out as her DJ stroke producer. So I was like working with Master Mix, putting a demo together for her. And then also I ended up uh, doing a track on the Bomb the Bass album and going on top of the pops and doing like the UK tour with them as well and scoring it. So that was cool. See, now, now I'm getting right into some depths of like, no, I didn't know. This is like, I didn't know about this area. I know the development and how it all came to part, yeah. how it came to that point. How, how was it going on top of the pops in, 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 at that time? That must have been mad. It was weird. I mean, yeah. I thought... Did anyone know you was awful dodgy at that point? Like, would they, do you think the, the, the media of that? Well... No, it wasn't. And the thing about it is I'd kind of left that and was like yeah. trying to focus on the music anyway. Yeah. Even though sometimes the two did overlap. Like, for instance, uh, I got like the Schoolie D tour. Uh, just a casual schooly detour. Do you well, know? only the UK, oh, south of England, promoting his album Saturday night. Baddest. Dude. But like, uh, I was on that tour doing backdrops. But like on one of the last shows, uh, they let us, let myself and Kev, who was there, uh, do like a DJ set, DJ MC set. There's a lot to be said about skill sets, isn't there? And if you really love what you're doing, if you really love what you're doing, you just lend your hand to it, don't you? Do you always, I mean, have you found that as, you know, on all these different modes and guises and disciplines, you you must get these moments where it's like, oh, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. Which one do you want? Which one do you want, man? Yeah, um, yeah. And once again, my girlfriend, she kind of, it frustrates her because it's like sometimes with introducing me to people, okay, so who do I introduce? <laughs> this this person is blah, blah, blah. Who do I introduce you as? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, is it AD or is it? That's interesting. Like, for instance, uh, she uh, is a graphic designer for a local council, and so I said, look, it's my real name, don't tell them. Don't go there, yeah. yeah. exactly. Why do you, do you think Because I'm sure t- they won't appreciate the stuff I get up to. Tight, yes, Steve. Legacy Hold is still holding it down, you see. Um, but it must be quite choosy, I guess is the, the right term for it. You've got all these guises and, like, which ones do you go for? I mean, which ones do you pull out at the right time? Huh? Well, then again, I think it's something that people naturally do anyway without necessarily thinking about it. Because, like I was saying to someone the other day, that it's like when you're growing up, you're a certain person with your friends mm. and then around family members and then possibly someone else with your parents or with other people in authority, like school teachers. Mm-hmm. You know, all these different sides of yourself that you just switch between what, as and when needed. Mm. So it's kind of like that. Yeah, isn't it? And you kind of do it without thinking about it. But with the DJ thing, I mean, that this in itself is like a... a, a, a it's a chapter. It's a whole fucking chapter. Yeah. What were the DJ... What were other DJs like when you would, would be active as a DJ? Because, you know, it's like it's very much like the graph thing, the beatbox thing, the MC thing. There is a real tunnel vision to some of these DJs and it's not, it's not, it's often frowned upon. How did you get so popular in such a short space of time and all of a sudden you're a DJ? You know, did you ever get any of that kind of comeback? No, because, I mean, it was more or less a thing of like, where I wanted to be a producer and because I didn't want, I didn't, I wanted to keep the two identities separate. Okay. So I thought, I'm not going to say DJ art or dodger because that's just like, that wouldn't be, yeah. Yeah, because it's just like trying to get fame as a DJ from a famous writing type yeah, of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it says, I want to be judged as a producer in my own right. Mm. So I just came up with the name 2000 AD, mm. which, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the, which is what I use for production. Yeah. So that people wouldn't know who I was, what my background was, yeah. they'll just be judging me on the music I was producing. Yeah. How many albums, as uh, 2000 AD, how many, did you, how many, how many songs over, over a period of time did you lend or contribute or do produce? Not as many as I liked. But obviously, there was like a track on the Bomb the Bass album. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there was like about maybe four or five tracks I did for Blade. Mm. Do you think it was a time, at that, that time, because remember, listen, we've got to remember, 
you know, we're sitting here doing a podcast. Would podcasts ever back then? No. The industry back then, it was like knocking on doors, wasn't it? So to be a fully fledged producer of tracks in any context, there was a lot of hurdles you had to get through. And a lot of, like you say, the industry had a very different pers- di- perception of like what it's right and what's deemed as hip hop and stuff. And then there was the public as well, the creating of the music. It was all very different landscape, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, it's one of those things where, I mean, kudos to Blade, the fact that he couldn't get a deal. I mean, I remember Rhythm King there where I That's remember right. sitting with Martin Heath in his office once yeah. and him listening to, like, a demo of Blade because, uh, yeah, because I think he was interested in signing Merlin and Blade. They ended up signing just Merlin because with Blade, Blade was also doing beatboxing then as well. Mm, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. tight. Because he was, uh, yeah, I remember sitting in, a, in Martin Heath's office, head of Rhythm, Rhythm King, and he was saying that he liked Blade's stuff, but he says, what can we do with him? He says, he's not black, he's not white, how, how can we market him? And I says, but he's good, shouldn't that matter? And, and then the age-old kind of doors and, you know, come up and you just don't know, yeah. He, with, with Blade, I... I found him. I found his. The, the, there was more power with him in the independent approach in which it's almost like it gave him a, a mission brief that actually worked with his USP. Do you know what I mean? Like the underdog. Yeah. I, there was something about that that was always appealing to me. You know, get that record because you're going to get your name written in the back of it, kind of shit. I think it was that thing which uh, appealed to a lot of people. Yeah. The fact I think it. it he connected obviously with a lot of heads because you're in a culture which is deemed by regular society as an outside fringe culture mm. which oh it's a fad it's going to die out soon or what it's not dead yet you guys are losers for still being part of it mm-hmm. and then this whole thing of I'm loving this thing I'd like to make not necessarily make money out of it but have it as my main thing so that I don't have to have a shitty nine to five yeah. but doors aren't opening for me Yeah, and here's this guy or as, as well as a few other people who are out there, doors may be being closed in their faces, but they're still finding a way to make it happen. That's right. And so if they can do it, we can do it too. That's right. And I think that spawned a lot of influence and inspiration for genres of music, you know, and independent labels in all walks. It's like, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Yeah, Which definitely. is cool as shit, you know. How many tunes in all in all, because you said the four weren't out uh, with Blade, but how many would you present to someone like Blade, for instance, back in the in day. How many, you know, it's all about how many shots you got in your, in your, you know, well, in your chamber. Right? Uh, I got burgled once, <clears throat> so they ended up taking my decks, but then didn't end up taking my records. So I just had this, like, cheap little hi-fi, <laughs> which I remember when, uh, yeah, because, I mean, he came to me soon after I got burgled, and he says, yeah, that he'd asked the Covent heads to... Uh, produce some of his demos and they says well unless you're paying us we ain't doing it which on one hand I can understand because yeah. it's like you're moving from having a laugh for something and you're moving to a stage where getting paid yeah because you're on the fringes of adulthood now so you've yeah. got to think about the rent and bills and food and all that stuff and yeah. just living so do you love, do you throw hip hop aside and get a regular job? Do you try and do both? Or do you try and make hip hop, make a go of hip hop or an aspect of hip hop where you can actually make a living from that? And so a lot of them were in that mindset, I suppose. So, so how did you figure, because you, if your stuff got nicked, that'd be like Tony Iommi losing his fingers. Like, what did you do? I thought, yeah, I was devastated. I thought, well, <laughs> fuck, I can't figure it out. It. But I thought, well, actually, they didn't take my records and I've got this shit little hi fi so I could still play through beats and stuff. Yeah, and I yeah. think. Yeah, I think, uh, so Blade came around once and he said to me, asked me if I could help him out with some production. And I says, and then he says that he wouldn't be able to pay me until... The, the yeah. things are out, yeah. I says, okay, so, so I says, okay, cool. Well, I'll do it and you just pay me when you get the money, mm. which didn't really happen, but okay. that's another story. That's another story. But like... Uh, Yes, I ended up... So, yeah, I remember uh, I played in, like, a few, ch- like, rhythms and beats and stuff, and one that he wanted to go... That, that he liked was uh, the Headhunters one mm. for Lyrical Mania. Mm-hmm. And so what I did was I said, OK, made a note of it, and then also coming as near does that. And so, like, for the Headhunters one, <laughs> I remember uh, 
basically doing like a pause button of the rhythm section. Stop <laughs> it. Seriously, for about five or six minutes of that, and then giving him the answers, okay, right to that. See what I'm saying? With restriction comes creativity. Yeah. That's cold. I love it. I had to do what I had to do. And so, yeah, with the uh, uh, coming is near, that was, yeah, because uh, even though I've, the initial basis of that, you know, the Gordon's Wall track uh, I did with Antonia in the studio, mm. when she dropped me as a DJ and producer, she ended up getting some other guys to do it. And then it ended up being the new She Rockers first track on stage. Really? And when I heard I thought, you fucking Fuck, yeah. bitch. <laughs> Wow. I'll just, I'll just no. confirm that Donna was cool. Me and her got on well. I mean, I remember her saying to me one time when I was in the studio, so if I phone you up at two o'clock in the morning and ask to come round because I want to work on an idea, would you, would you be okay with that? I says, absolutely. She can't, yeah. That's the that's sort of person I like because me and Blade would like have phone calls uh, talking over ideas, like he'd phone me up at three, four in the morning and I'd do the same thing. It's creative, man. You've, yeah. got to, you've just got to have the open, doors open. Yeah, Being creativity doesn't sleep. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for that. Yeah, but I mean, but Antonia, yeah, the way I see it, it was, she fucked me over, so I, yeah. So I thought, you know, and more so the way they did the track, I thought it was fucking shit. Mm. So when mm. I said to Blade, look, I want to use this track, but I want to do it the way I feel it should be done, mm. he says, okay, let's do it. So and then that yeah. track became The Coming Is Near. So the compensation was at least you had the whole control over that. You, may, you know, there may have been some discrepancies financially, but at least you know 1,000% it was to your creative spec. I mean, yeah. I mean, for me, the remit was that. My personal mission was to blow the She-Rockers truck out of the water. <laughs> That's the spirit. It, I was in battle mode. You know, it's like, it's kind of weird because it's like, and also being in the studio, it was like being, I still had that writer mindset yeah. of like, when a writer's going to a wall or whatever, late at night or to a yard, you're not going there to hang out. You're not going there to go for a stroll. Never you go there, or anything you, like yeah, that. Yeah, you go there, you yeah. do your shit, you fuck off. Yeah. That's it. Mm. So when I was in the studio, I was going there with this working mindset. Because yeah. like, Blade was like, oh, sit down. No, I'm not sitting down. Really? I, that, that? Yeah, I was like, I'm not going to relax until I'm shit's not looped up. I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah, I'm here to work. So until we're like looping shit and things running, then I'll relax. But until we actually get started, now I'm kind of like, um, That's let's do I'm this. That's what I'm talking about. Military. Yeah, and, and also even like the, the common is near itself. If you listen to the way yeah. it ends, it's not like, yeah, yeah, shout out to blah, 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 and yeah, big thing. Nah, it says, nah. Mm. We fucking, this thing explodes. We end Ow. suddenly. That's it. That that right mentality. You do shit. You fuck off. Oh, so that's that you, cold. So that you leave people thinking, what the fuck was that? Oh shit! Yeah. Do you think like I mean you know just just siding off of what we the topic, but do you relate it to the graffiti thing? Um, the the the, the attitude behind it. Um, we as people, particularly in, from a hip hop background, there is a athleticism, isn't there? And nothing is more raw than graph. Like, if you really apply, you can apply that to any form of, of discipline. If you know, if you really know the mentality of a hip hop head or a graffiti writer, mostly graffiti writers, you know that it's all about the coverage. It's all about spread. It's all about getting out, getting out, getting an attack, attack. Applying that to music or any other disciplines, dangerous, ain't it? It is not too, well to life in general. It yeah. kind of makes you a formidable <laughs> opponent. Yeah, and I think unless someone's kind of gone through that or they're empathetic to that, it's hard for them to get their head around. Mm. I've never understood why. Because be you so get some hard. people that just don't get it, and I don't get that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, who don't who don't want to be up, 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 up? Not just the up aspect, but just the whole mentality of a writer or the outlook of a writer. The whole like <clears throat> taking people out. Yeah, and that whole thing of kind of a semi-mistrust of authority or suspicion of authority and knowing what authority is really like or what they can really be like and, you know, not wanting to have photo ops all the time yeah. and, you know, yeah. being conscious about who's taking photos around you or where's this photo going to end up type mm. of thing, you know. Yeah, because no one seems to think that way no more, do they? No. That's quite an alarming thought, actually, when you put it in that context. Because how far is taking it too far? Because if you really want to go to the, to the mountain, if you want to go the distance, yeah. hammer, 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 but then there will come a moment where 
you're overexposed or something leaks into a certain that's out of your control i mean yeah i mean the whole thing with geotags and obviously one thing about the uh social distancing or anti-social distancing now is that it makes it for de- it makes it a hell of a lot easier for developing ai technology to de- to use facial recognition Ooh. because facial oh. recognition works <gasps> when you can easily separate people you can't you can't develop or accurately use facial recognition technology in a crowd because it doesn't work. Because oh, there's, there's a mass of faces. Shit, I never even thought of it. By like getting that. people to like separate, it can easily track a person and So just by default, whether it was intentional or unintentional, that actually They're making it a lot more it's basically you're pre- they're helping improve the algorithms of these things. Because they're becoming a lot more accurate now. We should be fighting against the algorithms. But the thing about it is, most people are scared. That's why, I mean, yeah. They want to fall in line because they fear. Yeah, fear is a great motivator. Divide and conquer is a great motivator. Of course. And the thing about it is, if you look at uh, Hitler's strategy for getting Germany in line in mm. the 30s, it's pretty much what uh, Boris Johnson's doing now. Mm, 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 mm. Do the math. Go back to the history books. It's all there. It's well, not just go back to Boris's book because he wrote about it when he did his, his uh, biography of Churchill. No way. Yeah. He talks about the, the Germans' method of... about some, He mentions Goebbels, how Goebbels mentioned the fact that once you get people... Once you, if you get people scared enough, yeah. you can get them to do anything. That's right, yeah. Complete mass control. Mass compliance. And that's the era we're living in now. Even talking about this right now, I bet the algorithms go... People have thrown common sense out the way in, and, it's been, and they've been replacing it with fear yeah. and compliance. That's creative. People, we, we genuinely... I mean, I, I'm so shit at it. I'm, I don't watch the news. I just got to the point where I'm just like, all right, I'll get the information. Yeah, I'll wear the mask for Nan. I'll wear the mask for my grandparents and auntie that's sitting on the tube. Cool. But as far as anything else goes, it's, to, me, to me, it's like, give me the right news... Otherwise, it's just noise, and it's so hard to find that right news. Well, that's because the news is censored. I mean, a lot of people, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Okay, really? So, uh, so you knew about the protest in Denmark then that happened a few months mm. ago? Mm. A lot of people don't even recognise exactly. it. Exactly, and for those that haven't heard about it, a few months ago, Denmark, the government, they says that they'll bring out a law in which everyone was going to be tested and have the jabs, etc. And that they were going to make it legal for the authorities to come into your house and take you away to be tested or jabbed. Fuck. They were going to make it law in Denmark. The people took to the streets, made noise and protested for nine straight days until the government says, OK, we're not going to do that. Wow. Can you imagine if that went through and what the... Good for them. That would have changed the whole world if that went through. Yeah, but basically... Nothing in the media over here. If yeah. you search for that story... I mean, I had people over here say, no, nah, no, nah, you're making it up. Mm-hmm. But then I had people in Denmark who I knew and other people who had relatives and friends in Denmark saying, yeah, it was true because they confirmed it. Jesus. Yeah, nothing of that was mentioned over here. What's going on? D-notice. Uh, basically, the government has something called a D-notice, which basically means there's a stop... If something gets into the press, they can put a D-notice on it, which means it will not get any media coverage. Not really? So that, that's going down like that? That's what a D-notice is, yeah. D-notice. Wow. Our landscape is just... It's not going to be the same. When yeah. we get out of this shit... <laughs> it's not, it's not the same, bro. if we get out of this. Because the thing about it is were basically being herded into a uh, down a path and maybe people can't even see it coming. Can't even see it coming. No. They can't even see it coming. Oh. And that opens doors to a huge bit. I mean let's... I mean yeah, it's basically to the the abridged version is uh you get everyone chipped, uh because they're not they haven't disclosed what ingredients are in this so called vaccine. Mm. So and if there are mechanical or nanotechnology, then basically we know that nanotechnology can be all sorts of things. Yeah. It can, if they're little robots, then they can... And they're being put inside these uh, fat packages 
to get into your cells, mm. then these fat packages are basically acting as like Trojan horses. Right, yeah. Yes, 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 I got you. Okay. And so if... And also, uh, those instituting this vaccine have said that we may still have to wear the mask after, after we've had the yeah. vaccine. Why would that be? Exactly. So then basically, so if this vaccine isn't going to stop transmission of the disease or the virus either in or out, what's it for? Yeah, 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 exactly. You're basically, basically being, it's like another way of like giving people microchips, like chipping yeah, dogs right. or children. Or at least slowly weaning that process to the end goal. Yeah, which is basically they're up in a slave state where everyone's hooked up to the cra- to the cloud, yeah. where there'll be no credit cards, everything will be That's on this right. biochip that yeah. you have. And so if you decide to protest or not fall in line, they'll turn off your credit. Yeah, they switch off your laptop. They switch off your. Um, you'll be like a plug. I noticed like. that. Okay, well, you, if you don't have this much, you know, I'm with you, man. Or just look I'm at what's happening it. in China. Yeah. What's happening in China is what they want for the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But you'll be monitored and controlled twenty four seven. Communism. Because I think we're beyond that. Because and also, if you look at the fact that they say, I remember in the nineties it was said that the ten percent control the ninety percent. Now, a few days later, a few decades later, that's changed from one percent controlling the ninety-nine percent. Mm. Now, don't you think this not this one percent are thinking, "Hang on, if people wake up, what the fuck's going to happen to us?" Yeah. So they have to basically get people into a stage of of being in a slave state, so they can control them. And making up stories like, "Oh, uh, the, the 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 illness, this this bug, this it's." In our, it's invisible, so you can't, you can't control that. But they make you feel like you're dependent on there's, them there's to save all, them. Yeah, it's the, the chains, they just move the goalposts. It's always an invisible enemy. Yeah, war and terror. Exactly. Okay. The Cold War. Cold War, yeah. <laughs> Every few decades, it's a new one, and now yeah. there's this one, and people, even though it's been instituted by someone who's blatantly gone against parliamentary law, openly defied parliament, done shit which is illegal, mm. has lied mm. continuously, has given f- contracts to people who don't deserve it or are unqualified, you know, and, and people wonder, why don't you trust the government? Why do you think Boris is... Because that's what he does. Mm. It's like, come on, if Jimmy Savile and Gary Glitter were to open a daycare or a nursery, would you send your kids there? No. Why not? Because exactly. So then, why the fuck are you trusting this fucking? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fat... You know what I mean? In terms of governing the country, when he's basically a liar, a thief, and a cheat, mm. and he's done illegal shit, which basically means the fucker should be prosecuted, mm. or at least he's shown that he's not fit to hold office. Education's key for these for these this information to be passed on right way through to. You know, historical reference points of where the enemy was invisible before. Yeah. And it's just... just also reasoning. I mean, people are not using common sense. I mean, it's like common sense is the most uncommon thing in the world right now. Yeah, for real. Um, Divide and conquer, again. Yeah, absolutely. Just playing to the weaknesses of people and, you know, just fooling, trying to bluff the educated. Just putting... Bits of work in there, that's... I mean, yeah, some people are waking up, but the reality is not fast enough. Mm. Because these fuckers are doing whatever. They're moving at a rate of speed. Fast as fuck. Yeah. Um, and like you say, as, a, as, a, as an artist first, you are built to ask questions and... Analyse. Analyse. Yeah. Think we're not people don't have that time. It's not. It's or at least they don't give themselves that time. It's it's and, and we. I always feel like we as artists, as individual artists, have a lot more time. We kind of work six months ahead of anything. We can, you could kind of forecast. That's why some of the best music comes out and it's like it ages well because you yeah. know six months to a year down the line it still holds water, doesn't it? It's funny how that works, isn't it? But we, we've just got a lot of time to think about this stuff and, and uh, not enough ears listening. 
I think that's the way they want it, though. As in, that's probably why they don't want to give art, more artists a platform. Because mm. mm. they know that a lot of artists will see things differently, will see past the smoke screen and the, and we'll see that this is an Emperor's New Clothes type situation. Emperor's New Clothes, oh, cold, yeah. That's why they're trying to shut down certain venues, they're trying to shut down sort of publications, stop conversations in places like pubs and stuff they don't want any or even online i mean yeah, yeah, the amount of out. censoring that youtube and like in google have done it's like fucking china yeah 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 yeah, yeah. twitter yeah. yeah it's like well why yeah that's a that's a whole nother podcast <laughs> it is <laughs> but you know in your in your career my brother just going back to you know podcast of the podcast come on so you've done some international traveling though I mean, you've been about. You talk about friends in, you know, in in Scandinavia, and various locations. I mean, you know, is there anything that you could definitively say, yo, that was a great time there, or you know? Uh, most of the traveling I've done is in terms of painting. Isn't isn't it's mainly been unlike youth arts projects. Mm. Like I've been to uh, Ukraine. That was wow, interesting. Ukraine's <laughs> lovely, right? Yeah, Beautiful but place. I must admit. Because I got offered to do a project out there, bringing a group of six young people. It's supposed to be like an international exchange. Yeah. Uh, getting European countries, well, or as a way of introducing European countries to Western European citizenship mm. and values and stuff like that. So they're having this youth, big youth arts project, supposed to be about maybe 48 people, 48 young people. So six young people... Each country was supposed to bring six young people and one youth leader. Right. So I was like the youth leader you did for this for the UK on this project. Uh, so there was U- so it was going to be held in Ukraine. Uh, Albania was supposed to go. Poland was supposed to go. Yugoslavia, I think Ooh. Bulgaria, and I think another country as well. Yeah. But only in the end, there was only us from the UK, and uh, obviously Ukraine because it was held there. And Poland that were there. Mm-hmm. The others didn't come. Shame. Because it was uh, end of 2014, early 2015. Mm. So that was that whole thing. Oh my God, there's civil war in Ukraine. Right. Okay. Happening. So and also, uh, yeah. Yeah, because I remember getting one of the first emails from because I, I didn't I didn't really watch the news. So I remember getting one of the first emails from the organizing in Ukraine saying, "Yeah, I know that." Some of you have like heard about the rights, and you go, "What? What? And you're wait like, a minute!" You're like, "Really?" <laughs> so I'm like going online, and I'm seeing all this shit yeah. about fucking riots and civil. War. I'm thinking, "What the? Fuck? What have I just done?" And it's you in want Kansas me to come? Anymore. Yeah, is that you want to go here? Yeah. So there's some more digging, and then I'm reading uh, information and come up digging some information on what I think Garth Crooks, the footballer, said: "Black people don't go to Ukraine because you'll come back in a body bag." And I thought. Oh shit! Because that was all that football stuff. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah, yeah, the racism over that stuff. What the hell am I letting myself in for? Wow. So yeah, so there was like a initial meeting of like the team leaders, which was going to be in January of 2015. So I thought, you know what? Fuck it. Do I'll, it. Go. I'll just go find out what it is for myself, and before I get people together. That's the b boy in you, man. That's like, like also fuck the this. the writer as well. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Let's do this. Fuck it. I'll find out for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went over there, and luckily, uh, well, not luckily, but the trouble that was happening was like in Kiev, the capital city. Yeah. But the plane was landed in a, a place called Borispol, which okay. was outside Kiev. So we bypassed any of that anyway. But it was like a five hour drive from the airport up to the place where it was in like northwest uh, Ukraine, mm. which was uh, 30 miles from the Russian border. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a whole thing of, you know, because remember when uh, uh, Russia annexed Crimea? Yeah. So that was all that whole thing of also going on about the threat from po- of possible invasion from I'll just fly Russia. in there, please. You know, <laughs> exactly. I'll just beeline. <laughs> okay, okay, so, yeah, so bypass the riots and stuff. Yeah, that's fine, but you're driving us to a place where... Yeah. 30 miles from the Russian border. So yeah. if there's an invasion, we're fucked. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> all these little... Yeah, sign me up. <laughs> God, you can't get away from the history. Like, those kind of moments, though, in your career, you know, we, this is what podcasts are for, isn't it? You can laugh yeah. about it in, in, a, in a sense now, but at the time, it was a proper thing that was going on. And like, oh, but no, I mean, one of the hardest things was actually getting the other young 
getting people signed up for the project. Because that's what it's all about. Yeah, because people are like, well, what's it about? It's in, yeah, projects in Eastern Europe. Yeah, you're interested in coming. It's free. Mm. All expenses paid. It's free. Oh, great. Which part of Eastern Europe? Ukraine. What? <laughs> Ukraine. <laughs> what? There's war there. My mum said I shouldn't go because blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And the thing about it is, so I go on like, the Home Office website mm. to try and alleviate their fears. And I'm reading head like, don't go to Ukraine. Oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that makes it worse. But then I says, look, at the end of the day, I'm in direct contact with the organisers who live in Ukraine yeah. and they said it's totally safe. Yeah. So a few people signed up, but not many. I'd go with it, man. I really would if, if someone said to me, no, it's, like, it's totally chilled. Yeah, up. but no. the thing about it, it just goes to show... The power. Not just that of the media, because if you went by the reports here, it's fucking civil war. It's like mm. going to Gaza. Yeah, you know it, I mean? uh, Oh, my God, absolutely right. We have to remind ourselves, Britain, because this is an international show, big shout out to the international crew, but we're only an island. We're only an island. The world is big, and, uh, yeah, the media can be very controlling. <laughs> exactly. It is, and that showed me, just rem- no, that showed me, reminded me of how the media likes to manipulate, you know, public mm. opinion. Or mm. well, we can manipulate media too. Let's, rem- let's remember, like, there's this, there is this kind of dance, isn't there, of them taking what independent artists and creatives and media do and adapting it to their, how, how they want to funnel information, go to the core, whether it's social media or not. But that can be the same dance that independent artists and people have too. We can take and manipulate and make things to, to work to our great yeah. against too, you know. Mm-hmm. So I know what you're saying. It's a, it's a very interesting dance, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And and it's one that's just getting faster and faster, you just gotta keep up with it. Yeah, or just do your own thing and get your own stuff out there, I guess. What's the future? <laughs> uh, As if we haven't predicted it already. But what's your future? What's the future for Heartful Dodger, man? Uh I suppose just freedom and creativity. Yeah. I mean my thing is it's not about I mean, the whole thing of being the best, I, I let that stuff go a long time ago. And I'm not going to be because there's some seriously badass talent out there. But uh, it's just about, uh, I want to say leave this world in a better situation or in a better state than I found it. Yeah. But the way shit's going, that's not going to fucking happen. But it's just to basically make a positive and lasting contribution. Yeah. And also to help people think. Mm. Or kind of like challenge people's perceptions of the status quo. Yeah. And I think with like the street piece, some of the street pieces that I do, that's what they're about. And just for those people that don't know, a lot of the street pieces that you see on Instagram, they're not sponsored. I don't have council payment or some corporate sponsorship or pay for materials. It's off my own back because for me, that stuff is pretty much like taking, like I said, having that writer's mentality and just put, like, putting a different spin on it. Mm. It's like, for instance, one of the pieces that uh, is well known in South London and Peckham was one of a uh, princess I did of uh, Carrie Fisher after she died. Wow, OK. And that's lasted about, I mean, writers have gone over it recently or in the past year or whatever. Yeah, the butthurt crew. But basically it's a thing of where... I expected that to last like maybe a couple of months at the most. But it took it, it lasted a distance. Yeah, so I wow. mean, it's the fact that people are going over it's part of the course because I expected, I mean, I did that without permission. So I expected the council to say, you know, we're not having that here and just paint over it. Yeah. And the same thing with most of the stuff I do. I just. Maneuvers. Yeah. I Old mean, school maneuvers that just can apply in any weather. Just fucking. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure lots of writers out there have their own little. Tips and tricks on yeah. shit, how they get shit done. So. I love a good tip and trick. I love a good, you know, a little n- nudge at the man. I love it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's also a reminder to myself that the battle still continues, that don't let the fuckwits get away with it, you mm. know. Mm. It's get worth kind of like keeping them on their toes. Mm. Yeah. Well, may, n- may that rain. Yeah. King Arthur Dodger in the house. Thank you so much for passing. Never through. been a king, but if I can influence people, then it's all good. Every single, every single legacy holder that I throw the king mantra at, they say the same thing. But them out there, if I didn't say it, they'd give me a right ribbon. <laughs> Fact, <laughs> legend, the man. 
still legacy holder today at Arthur Dodger. Thank you so much for passing no, through. No, it's been good. I appreciate the invite. It's good, wasn't it? We had a good yeah, time. Definitely. Each and every time, Killer Keller podcast, you stay lucky, people. Don't forget, sharing is caring. Get that thing out there, up there. Tell the world, tell a friend to tell a friend. Do not sleep. I repeat, do not sleep on this. Repeat, we're out like that. Stay lucky, people. Peace. Woo! <laughs>